Can you please turn the pages of your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11? And can I invite Kent to please come and um, read the passage for us? Morning, church. Genesis 11, the whole chapter, and chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with the children of man, with the, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they purpose, propose, will do to do will now be possible for them. Come let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was a hundred years old, he fathered Archippash, Ashbetzad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Archippashad five hundred years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpashad had lived thirty-five years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpashad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eba. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eba 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eba had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eba lived after he fathered Peleg. 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru, and Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug, and Ru lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor, and Serug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah, and Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, the Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, 
and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. For through your word, Lord, you created the heavens and the earth. You sustain all of creation. You brought about the work of recreation so that sinners like ourselves may be born again to new life in your kingdom. And not one part of your word shall pass away till all is fulfilled. And we are the custodians of your word today, the Church of Jesus Christ. And we pray now in this hour that your word would go forth, would would grant us to attain knowledge, understanding, and wisdom to live out these truths. That in our living, Christ may be exalted. So through the person and work of the Holy Spirit, may we all behold Christ crucified in this time. May we see the beauty of your, your saving work through the ages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is dead. Nietzsche wrote a piece. Now Nietzsche was kind of like a philosopher, writer in the 19th century. He didn't coin the phrase he popularized the phrase, God is dead. You've seen some people even have t-shirts, God is dead. You hear people today proclaiming, God is dead. And in this piece called The Madman, I, I, I recommend you to, to read the work in a portion called The Gay Science, not the way we understand the word gay today. It's got to add a different meaning back then. In section 125, 125, listen to this quote. My apologies, um, I couldn't get it onto the screen. But listen very carefully to this quote. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe off the blood of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? Close quote. You had a period, both in the church and outside of the church, especially in the 19th century. Within the church, it was by a German man called Friedrich Schleiermacher. But there was a movement of the Enlightenment, they called it, in those days. And Enlightenment because we now see what's, what's really true. And the Enlightenment movement, especially with regards to religion or the Christian faith, did away with all the supernatural aspects of the Bible. And the effects of that are still being seen largely in the western um, part of the world today. It's what gutted Christianity in Europe at that time. And we are still reeling from the effects of the Enlightenment to this day. Simply put, it's man's way of saying, we know better than God. In fact, There is no God. If you want to believe in God, it's fine, it's okay. But we all know there's no God. There are men, and sadly, women, 
with dog collars in Europe today who profess to be, get this, ministers, Christian ministers who don't believe in God. And people like Nietzsche popularized this phrase, God is dead. And he actually, he makes a good point. Nietzsche sees something that sadly, I don't mean to be rude, but deluded Christians who reject the truths, the central truths of the Christian faith, who call themselves Christians, but reject the word of God, reject the authority of the word of God, reject the truths in the word of God, yet still call themselves Christians. Nietzsche understood something rightly. Did you hear what he said? This is a great thing because he understood rightly that Christianity was the central pillar, but not just pillar, but foundation right from the time of the Romans. Everything that we valued in Europe, everything that made sense, all morality was uniquely derived from the Bible, from the Word of God. You see, Nietzsche recognized the crisis that this death of God represented for existing moral assumptions in his day. The assumptions in Europe as they existed within the context of traditional Christian belief. Listen to what he also says here, Nietzsche wrote here. Let me quote this for you, listen to this. Please listen carefully. When one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. This morality is by no means self-evident. By breaking one main concept out of Christianity, the faith in God, one breaks the whole. Nothing necessary remains in one's hand. This is why in that, unquote, this is why in The Madman, a passage which primarily addresses non-theists, especially atheists, the problem is to retain any system of values in the absence of a divine order. So in other words, have you ever heard the phrase, there's no center? The phrase there's no center means we can't know what's right or wrong, what's good and evil. It is subjective to you. Whatever you as an individual decides is right or wrong, then that's right or wrong. But church, it's a lie from the pit of hell. People are being disingenuous and they're lying to you and all these academics and the elites that are writing this stuff, they themselves would, cannot live by what they're writing. They themselves understand, like Jacques Derrida, the French atheist philosopher, I like him, you know why I like him? He rightly understood, if you take God out of society, how do you determine anything? An atheist. The problem of man, and we've seen it here in our own society, is that man has proclaimed himself as God. Man has said, we will decide what's right or wrong. But you see the problem. So let's imagine Nicola and I are having a dispute as to who's right and wrong. Nicola thinks one thing, I think another. How do we decide who's right or wrong? Well, you know what usually happens? The stronger person beats the weaker person. That's human history. One person imposes their will on another person. If there's no right or wrong, who are we 
to incarcerate anybody in prison. Right? How dare we imprison anybody? If there's no right or wrong, if there are no absolutes, we call it absolutes, then how, who gives us the right to lock up anyone? Why are we disgusted when a spouse cheats on, on their partner? What informs us, but wait a minute, if there's no right or wrong, who cares? Right? If I want to marry a hundred wives, sleep around, hey, I don't even need to marry them. Who cares, right? If there's no right or wrong, there's no good or evil. People like Richard Dawkins, if you ask them, is rape evil? They will not answer you because it destroys their philosophical premise that there are no absolutes. But do you think they believe that? No. You see, people like to propagate these things because it allows them, listen to this, this is what it comes down to. It allows them to be able to live and do whatever they want. That's all it is. I know, because I've counseled people as a Christian minister. And when you begin to touch the heart of some people's matter, you know what they do and turn around to you and say? Don't tell me how to live my life. I'm like, no, God's word says it, not me. Don't tell me how to live my life. Why? Because people want to do whatever they want to do. They want to enjoy whatever they want to enjoy. Sadly, we see that in the church as well. People choose to do whatever they want to do, and our commitment only goes as far as it doesn't disturb my comfort zone. The moment the pastor starts to poke at your comfort zone, all of a sudden your commitment comes into question. It's mankind. Look around us. We've proclaimed ourselves God, and that's the height of our arrogance and insult to God our Creator. And that's what we're going to see demonstrated for us this morning as we consider this vital portion. And it's a two part of our eight part series. Because we're going to seek to answer, because what you're going to see in the remainder of the Old Testament is about Israelite, the Israelites, these Hebrew people. And it's hard for you and I, living here in Africa, here in South Africa, here in Velcom, to maybe relate. How does this history laid out for us in this book, how does that relate to us? How should we see it? How should we understand it? And how are we to adopt a, but, uh, this worldview? Don't forget, that's the purpose of this whole series, that we understand the arc overarching story that we may adopt a biblical worldview of looking at things. How does it all play out? Well, I'm hoping to lay some foundations today, very crucial ones, coming from the broader spectrum of all mankind and then narrowing to the Hebrews. And it's going to be a big job next week. It's going to be in one sermon taking you through the whole of the Old Testament. So we've seen already, haven't we? Men created in God's image to represent God, to rule in God's, or rule under God on this earth as under kings or vice regents. And we've seen man was created in such a way, remember we spoke about the four states? So Adam, who was able to sin, but he was able also not to sin. This is big theology, by the way. I've, I've simplified for you. It's massive theology. And it's very interesting. If you're ever bored and you want to know what it's all about, just come and knock on my door. Able to sin, able not to sin. But we all know what he did, didn't he? He sinned. But now, the age we're li- all through, we're going to see throughout all of the Old Testament and right up to now is... Man, not able not to sin. 
All he can do is sin. Why? Ephesians chapter 2, remember that? Verse 1, 2 and 3. He's dead in his trespasses and sin. He's got three problems. The devil, the world, and his own flesh. He's bound by his nature. He is what he is. He sins. It's not the sins that make him a sinner. He sins because he is a sinner by nature. Is what he is. He can't save himself. He can't deliver himself. But praise God, remember, verse 4 of chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, but God, who is rich in mercy, right, bought salvation through Jesus Christ. We are saved by faith through, by, by grace through faith. There's a group of people who are now able not to sin. That's you and I. And some of you are going, Phew. But that's true though. In Christ, we are able not to sin. That's the truth. Do not believe the lie of the devil. Do not believe, believe the lie of your own flesh. Do not believe the lie of, of other people. The Bible tells us we have the spirit of Christ. We are able not to sin. We still sin. We are able not to sin. We're able to resist the devil. We're able to resist temptation. But it's coming a day when we, we will be unable to sin. Amen. Amen, indeed, yes. I look forward to that day. When cake will be legal. Hey, everybody has their hope. I'm just, I'm just speaking my mind out loud. Don't forget this. It's important you remember this picture. Man has these four areas of relationship. And it was a good, it was a good thing. We're created good, always good, very good. Our relationship with God, man fellowship with God. He was at peace within himself. His relationship with his other humans was, was wonderful. And also with the world around him. But because of sin, his relationship with God is now corrupted, which results in war within himself, which res also results in broken relationships. We all know about this, but also is at odds with the creation around him. And all of this is a result of the fallout of sin. And what we're going to see over the next... I mean, you could categorize the whole of the Bible under these four headings. We saw it, remember, in Genesis, when we were studying Genesis. Creation, you got the fall, you got redemption, and then restoration or the recreation. If you, if you remember those four things, he'll help you give a, a, a good guide as to categorizing the whole of Scripture under these headings. But the story of God is about the kingdom of God. Never miss that, because you're going to see in a few weeks' time, when Jesus comes on the scene, he's talking about the kingdom of God. It's all about kingdom. And he's reminding us and pointing us back, God is king. So we saw last week, didn't we, how... Um, oh, and this, this is a little bonus... Remember the story arc thing? Pastor Louis, aren't you disappointed? You really, really are disappointed with all of you. We spent so many weeks, week, every, every week, about seven weeks now, Pastor Louis, he showed this thing. You should all remember it. So there's a good arc, story arc, for understanding the Bible. The creation, the fall, redemption, restoration. Just a little stuff in there. Um, I'll leave it there for now. So man falls and he is cast out from God's presence. We saw that last week. And then he's cast east of the garden, from God's temple garden, where he, he enjoyed such amazing fellowship with God. But what happens... After that, it's very interesting. And Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11 are very crucial passages. I call them the, the foundational blocks of redemptive history. If you want to understand, even the arc of history, pay attention to the flow of events from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11. You will see that we are now living in the age of Genesis 11. 
You'll agree with me. You'll see by the end of today, hopefully. This morning, we're going to consider just three headings briefly. The reign of sin, the chaos of sin, and the pride of sin. So the reign of sin, the chaos of sin, and the pride of sin. And this is part one of the king choosing Israel. So what happens? Let's first consider the reign of sin. And this covers Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 5. So what we see is the corrupting influence of sin um, immediately after Genesis chapter 3. And what we see the story of Cain and Abel. We all know the story of Cain and Abel. If we don't, apologies if you're not that familiar with the Bible. There's a lot of detail I'm leaving out. Um, but please, once again, feel free to always hit Pastor Louis and myself. Um, just contact us. We are more than happy to expand upon the things we're teaching. Like I said at the beginning, this is an overview study. So we're not going into too much detail. So, imagine reading this story about how the heaven and the earth was created. Man's relationship with God and man falling before God. God's plan to redeem man, to call a people to himself. And immediately after that, although they didn't have chapters, but in chapter 4, straight after chapter 3, the first human being to be born is Cain. The first human being to be born of another human being is Cain. And do you know how terrible it is? Here's what we learn. The first baby... The first person that came forth out of a woman's womb is a murderer. That is given to us to remind us of our corrupted nature. He's a murderer. Listen, you can give your child the best environment, the best school, the best everything. He's still a nasty little so-and-so. Don't get me wrong. A nice environment to bring up a child is good. But you know what the problem is? That little cute baby is a sinner. That baby's soul is bound in sin and nature's night. It's corrupt. David said, in sin, Psalm 51, did my mother conceive me. We're sinners from birth. We're sinners by nature. And Cain, the first one, this, does this not blow your minds? He's a murderer. Not, not a thief, not a liar. He's a murderer. What better environment can you get than the environment that Cain was born into? Yet he murdered his brother. And yet, you know what? God graciously, before he murders his brother, God graciously warns him. He says, listen, if you do what's right... You'd be accepted. But he chose not to do what's right. But again, before he murdered him, God graciously warned him again and said, Listen, if you do not repent and change, do you know what? We find here in the text, God warns him that if he's not careful, sin will leap on him like a wild animal. I want you to imagine a crouching tiger. I want you to imagine, you see one of those nature programs, a lion is, is, is low and it's just creeping up. I want you to imagine that picture. That is what the Bible has in mind about sin. Sin is ready, just waiting for you to give the go-ahead. It will consume you. It will devour you. You cannot play footsie with sin. You cannot play with the edges or blur the lines of sin. You will always lose. It will consume you. It's like when I used to counsel young people and about dating, and they'll ask the question, how far can I go? You can't go far at all. Because you're playing with the edges. You're playing with the lines. You're playing footsie. You will lose. 100% you will lose. 
because like a wild animal, it will pounce. So what we see is that the family that God means to be a source of companionship and joy has become a place of jealousy, rage, and murder. Yet God does not, graciously, does not destroy them. Man is still alive. They're living on. And we see this with Cain. Cain is shown some level of mercy. He goes out and he finds a city. And he names that city after his son, Enosh. Enoch, sorry. And we see again in Genesis 4, um, verse 70 to 22, cities and culture have been built. And yet, despite the corrupted nature, man is still fulfilling God's mandate to fill the earth, to expand, but also to explore, to enjoy the arts, engineering, and all of these things, music and so on. These are good things. Some people want you to believe rural places are good, cities are bad. Yeah, a lot of bad things happen in cities. But I, again, feel free to disagree with me. I don't think that's what is being communicated to us. Although it's talking about Cain's line, I don't believe that's what's been communicated. I rather think we're seeing mankind fulfilling the mandate to rule and subdue the earth. And then we see in chapter 4, verse 24 evil Lamech of the line of Cain. This guy is a murderer too. But guess what? He's the first poet we have recorded in the Bible. We like poetry, right? But here we are, the first poem we read in the Bible, or we have someone, the first poet, is a murderer. And a boastful one as well. And he's the first person to marry two wives, by the way. He says, hey, if Cain is regarded like this, wait, well, the way I killed a man, I'm bigger than Cain. He boasts in his evil. But what's the point of all of this? It's to show us the de- degrading effect of sin. And this is shown in chapter 5. Look in your Bibles in chapter 5 quickly, Genesis 5. Just have a look there. I want you all to see something. You see the pattern, right? In chapter 5. There's some things repeated again and again. It jumps out at you. Can you see it? Especially one phrase in particular. It's a, it's a refrain again and again. See, and he died. Thank you. Here's, here's the summary Moses gave to us of Adam to Noah. And all you see is this. This guy came along at this age, had children, lived another so many years, and he died. Then the next guy, same thing, lived to this age, had some children, then he died. And on and on, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, again and again. That's purposely put there, so as we read it, we are confronted with our own mortality. In fact, Seth, back in chapter 4, end of chapter 4, Seth the one they had after Abel was killed. He has a son, and his name Enosh. You know what Enosh means? It means, it can mean three options. Man, it could mean a person, but it also means this, to be mortal. And the idea is this, when, when Seth names his child Enosh, he's not just calling him man, but he's actually saying this, Human beings are terminally ill. We're we're just going to keep dying. That's the idea. We die. We're born, we die. We're born, we die. Is he lying? Because all of us here are going to die. 100%. Unless you're Enoch, the one who was translated, or Elijah. I know the clever ones again, but what about Elijah and Enoch? Yeah, that doesn't even register like 0.00000%. Doesn't even register. We die. We're born, we die. That's a fact of life. And it's because of sin. 
Death came into the world, the Bible teaches us, because of sin. And we're presented with the loss of men. And in all of this, the genealogy goes all the way down to a man called Noah. And his name means rest or comfort. And his father, another Lamech, names him rest in hope. Maybe this one. Because you know why? Everyone's waiting for the seed of the woman from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Will this be the person? Will this be the person? When Eve had Cain, she thought it was Cain. Boy, was she wrong. They all thought, oh, this is the seed. This is the seed that will, will, trample the, will, will crush the head of the serpents. No. Another, and the point is this. No, that's not the seed. That's not the seed. Because he dies. He dies. He dies. He dies. He dies. And we're just seeing rotten people. And you look at all of this, you think, is there hope for men? Well, there is. And that leads us to our next heading, the chaos of sin in Genesis chapter 6 to chapter 9. And this whole section is almost a, kind of a repeat, a resetting of creation. Remember at the beginning, we have the world presented to us almost in a kind of chaos state, but then brought to under, order, sorry, brought to order through one man. God puts him there, you know, fill the earth, tend to it, subdue it. But here we are in chapter 6 of Genesis, and we're faced with chaos again as a result of sin. So through Lamech, though Lamech hopes for rest and relief, what comes with the flood is actually terrible judgment, is what we're going to see in Genesis chapter 6. And in verses 1 to 8 of Genesis 6, we're given a description of how evil has taken a stranglehold of humanity. In your own time, when you go home, read Genesis chapter 6, especially verses 1 to 8. And the description there given of mankind is, you see, the divine disgust with man. The divine disgust with man. God says, I'm wiping all of you out. But it doesn't wipe everyone out to the point where I need to start again totally. He saves eight people, the family of Noah, a man called Noah, who found favor before God. And the story of the flood reveals a God who is both a holy judge and a gracious redeemer. Because what you're going to see played out throughout this four section of redemptive history are stories of God punctuated throughout of God saving and delivering his people. You'll see it again and again. And all of these stories of God's acts of deliverance, redemption, which are also coupled with judgment always, are pointing to a greater work of redemption and judgment. And as you read the Old Testament, you and I would do well to pay attention to all of these stories. You know why? Because they're all played out in the Gospels. You need to make sure that your mind is saturated with these stories and with certain characters in the Old Testament because when you get to the Gospel, you will have hyperlinks that remind you again and again of what has gone before. And the writers of the Gospel and the New Testament, they purposely do this because they want you to see that it's one story, it's a continuation. So God says to Noah, I'm going to keep my covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. So we all know the story. Noah, build the ark. Get in the ark. I'm going to bring flood in the rain. The flood comes, whoosh, and... <laughs> It wasn't so, it was much more than whoosh. So raining for 40 days, but it took over a year about for the rain to kind of reside and so on and go away. And at the end of this, in Genesis 9, God renews his covenant with creation through 
this person Noah. And God tells Noah that he will establish his covenant with him. And covenant here refers to an already existing relationship God has with mankind. Very important to remember that. And let me give a definition of covenant you can always remember. Um, A man called O. Palmer Robertson gave a good short description of covenant. Covenant means this, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A bond in blood sovereignly administered. Let me repeat that. A bond in blood sovereignly administered. And the point is this, and again, covenant is something that plays out throughout. Pay attention to the covenants you see in the Old Testament. All of this plays out in the New Testament. If you miss it, you miss a lot of what's going on. And the point is a bond in blood. A bond is this. It it, it gives the impression of God binding himself to a people. I'm tying myself to you. I am binding myself to you. And blood, as they did in those days, if you're going to make some kind of treaty, you have to shed blood. A sacrifice or something was, was made. But also sovereignly administered means this. It's very important. Don't forget this point. God is the one who's initiating the covenant. And he's the one who will fulfill it ultimately. So God says he's going to enter the covenant with Noah. And Noah was, in a sense, the new Adam. Because look at the words... If you look in Genesis 1.18 and Genesis chapter 9 verse 1 and verse 7, it's the same instruction to do what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God tells Noah. So humanity starts again. Yes, if you're reading that for the first time, you think, hey, this is good. But it doesn't last long, does it? Because then we read, Noah, this righteous man, is a bit of a drunk. And some of it, one of his sons is a bit of a nasty little fella. Now we don't fully understand the grave sin of Ham, what he did. I mean the nakedness part, what maybe is a euphemism for something else, we don't know. But we understand it was something bad that grieved Noah to the point where he also cursed um, his grandson, Canaan. So again, we see man growing Evil continuing, sin continuing, the effects of sin being felt. But the height of this brings us to our third heading, the pride of sin. And this is what I want you to really pay attention to. So in Genesis chapter 10, it tells us of the world's nations emerging from the sons of Noah. But sadly, this story doesn't go too well either. Do you know why it doesn't go too well? Because of sin. The writer wants you to know of sin's effect, of sin's effect in man and its corrupting nature for all men, but also more than that, our need for deliverance from sin. I don't know about you, but there are periods in my life when I, especially one in particular, where I seriously Man, I was backsliding. It was bad. Do you know one of the things that got me in that period? One thing that hit me, one truth that still stays with me today. How tiring sin is. If you don't know that, you, you don't know sin too well. I, I kid you not. I don't mean to be um, funny. Seriously. Sin is tiring. You need energy to sin. And to maintain a life of sin. Especially when you know you're living contrary to God's will. It's like an assault on the mind. Again and again. And that's what they want you to feel here. Like, oh, not again. Because now, in Genesis chapter 11, we all know the story of Babel. Well, most of us should. If you haven't, read that passage again. We had um, Uncle Ken read that out for us. Thank you once again. Genesis 11. And the story of Babel, don't miss this church. 
It's very important. The story of Babel is a monumental, it's a monumental, communal attempt by Adam's race to wrest human autonomy from God. It's man's attempt, once again, to say to God, we are kings, we'll be our own gods. Isn't that what we're seeing in the world around us? God is dead. There is no God. And even if there are gods, it's a God of our own making. And that's what the point of this story is. And I'm telling you now, history is following the same trajectory as we're seeing in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. When man presents himself as God, what's going to happen with the Antichrist? Same thing. It's going to be an affront to God. It's man taking his finger and sticking it in God's eye. Babel means actually... In ancient Mesopotamia, people don't know this, Babel actually means the gate of God. So they used to build these things, these ziggurats. You've seen them. They're like a pyramid. And they'd have at the top this thing where they put a table for the gods to come down and feast and a place for the gods to, to rest from the long journey of coming down. So these people said they'll build such a thing and they reached up to the heavens. But the point of it really was to make a name for themselves. To make a name for themselves. To invite the gods of their own making. Because people still had the knowledge of God. People still saw the story of creation. But also people chose to reject the truth of God's word and the truth about creation. And they made their own gods and made themselves God and that's what we're seeing here in Genesis 11 so this word Babel or Babel means gate of God but in Hebrew what Moses does is to have a play on words almost mocking what they're doing and what he does is this the word Babel in Hebrew actually means to be confused or mixed up. So it's mocking them because of what happens, transpires um, at this event. And it's really funny when you see what, especially in the Hebrew, what Moses is doing with this portion um, of scripture. An ancient Hebrew would probably be laughing his head off at this portion. Because they get it. We don't. It was lost on us. Babel is the ultimate symbol of man's failure when he attempts to be independent of his creator king. So God commanded man to spread out, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, spread out. They said, no, we're not going to do that. Mm Mm-mm. Instead of a God-given unity and identity, what do they do? They seek a false autonomous collectivism and a reputation of their own devising. This is a repetition of what we've seen in Genesis 3 of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man choosing and deciding for himself how he's going to live, how he's going to do things, not God's way but his way. He's going to decide how society should be. He's going to decide what's right and wrong. He's going to decide how we are to worship God, not what way God wants it. He's going to decide what, what is God, who are the gods. He's going to decide for himself. And when he's doing that, what is he effectively doing? He's making himself God because he's the one who's deciding all things. But the divine irony is seen in verse 5 and 6 of Genesis 11. They're going to build this big structure to the heavens. God says, it's so small and minuscule. Let's go down and see what's going on. 
You see, a Hebrew person would be rolling on the floor laughing. You and I are going, well, now's the meaning. No. So it's like God going, huh? Let me see how small. Hey, I can't see I'm so far down. I need to go down and see this thing. It's divine mockery. Just like in Psalm 2, when God laughs in derision at man's attempt to overthrow him. That's what we're seeing here. And what happens? God acts in judgment. Their language is confused. They're scattered. So there's one guy, and he's saying to the other guy in Zulu, hey, pass me the brick. And the other guy's going, huh? And he's speaking Spanish back, saying, hey, I don't understand what you're saying. And he's like speaking to his other friend, saying, what's this guy doing? And I speak to him in French. And like, they're all confused now. And the people are scattered. But Psalm, so Deuteronomy 32, tells us what's really going on. The people are scattered. They've rejected God. They've rejected the truth about God. And God says, that's fine. I'm going to choose one nation, one group of people to be mine. And I'm going to, through this people, demonstrate to everybody else that I am God, that Yahweh is God. There's only one true living God. There's no God besides me. And I'm going to demonstrate that all of that through this one group of people. And through them to call everybody else back to me. And immediately after that, what does God do again? Like he's done twice before. He calls a man. He created a man, Adam. He calls a man, Noah. Now, in the outworking of his plan of redemption, what does he do at the beginning? He calls a man. Then he calls a family. And he calls a people. That through them, all the nations of the earth might be blessed. But why Israel? Why Abram and not Lot? Or Job? Why Abram? Why the Israelites? We'll see that next week. <laughs> So let me summarize this. Babel stands as a monument to the perennial human desire to build our own kingdom apart from God. You can't do that, church. You can't. We can't. We're not supposed to. And as the story progresses, we will see how God leaves the other nations to themselves, to their own devices and folly. Like I said, he chooses a man and his descendants. He covenants with them and he calls the people through them for the purpose of calling all nations to return to their creator king. Church, what's our take home today? You and I are the beneficiaries of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's appointed king, his son. And you and I today, by God's mercy and grace, through faith, are partakers of his kingdom. And by doing so, we, are, we have sworn allegiance to the king. That means we are to demonstrate believing loyalty, because in kingdom is about allegiance and loyalty to the king. You never show allegiance and loyalty to two, three, two, three four kings. Doesn't make sense. To one king. And that king is responsible for everything in a kingdom and your own um, health and prospering and everything flows from that king. Unlike the kings of the earth, this king is a benevolent king, is a good king, a very good king. And he has brought us back into the kingdom by being born again. Now, you and I can continue in blessedness, in rich communion, through our union with Christ, by continuing our worship of the king, adoring him, 
being single-minded, letting our hearts be united in our worship of him and him alone. That's loyalty. That's allegiance to the king. And how do we do that? The Bible tells us by submitting, humbling ourselves to, according to his word. He's given us his word. When Israel came out of Egypt, before they could go to the promised land, they had to come to the mountain, to Sinai, to be given the word that they may live the kingdom life in the land. Well, the same with Christians, we're born of the word. We're recreated in the image, renewed image of Christ to live for him alone. That's why he's our Lord and Master. But here's, here's my challenge to all of us this morning. Is that true? Is that true? Only you can answer that. Is that true in your marriage? Is that true in your parenting or how you relate to your parents? Is that true in your workplace or in your college or universities or schools? Is it true there? Can people see that Jesus is your king and you are citizens of his kingdom? Do they see kingdom people? Do they see us thinking kingdom? Because church is important, we adopt the mindset of citizenship. That's the government we pay attention to. You and I are ambassadors of that kingdom and we are all resident in this embassy. But when you're part of an embassy, this local church body, it comes with some rules. So I'm, I'm, there's so much more application to this, but I want to speak to one in particular. How we do church. You see, people try to live kingdom apart from the embassy of the kingdom. You can't do that. It doesn't work. How can you do church apart from the local church body? I don't know how you do that. You can't do that. We can't do that. It's a contradiction. If you walk out of here, despite hearing all of this, please, the point is you go home and you think about the ramifications of what we've been talking about. That's why we provide so much information. And still choose to do your own thing. You are living the life of Babel. You are deciding for yourself how things are going to be. You are choosing to be your own God or to worship a God in your own image. In an image that looks like Ken, that looks like Jabu. No. Only one, Christ. And if you're not plugged into what we're trying to do, it's not my church. Can I say that? How many times can I say that to us? It's not my church. A man is not my church. It's not Joshua's church. It's not Louis' church. It's Jesus' church, the King's church. And this is the local chapter of that church here in Bedelia. And he calls you and I to abide by certain dictates in order to function rightly as the embassy of the kingdom of God here in Velcom. But if you stray from the mandate of the king, you are in violation of the rules that govern embassies and ambassadors. You are what we call rogue. You've gone rogue. You're a rogue ambassador. You're not representing Jesus, the king, anymore, but yourself. And you know what the kingdom does? It says we don't recognize that guy. Church. Let's be church. What's the hindrances that's that's stopping us from being church? Let's let's deal with it. Let's talk about it. But there's, listen, I'm going to finish with this. Nowhere in the whole, in the corpus, the body of scripture, nowhere in the whole of the Old Testament and New Testament, nowhere does the Bible recognize a Christian that seeks to be 
a disciple and live and thrive and flourish apart from the church. To do so is to worship a God of your own making. And you are in direct violation of the word of God. Let's heal. Let's heal. Let's restore. Let's come together. And God grant us the wisdom in how to do it. Amen. Let's bow our heads. In your own heart there, please, let each one consider their role within God's kingdom and how we live unto ourselves in violation of God's word in many aspects, not just with regards to the local church, but in, in, in every area of our lives. That we will not be living the life of Babel, building monuments to ourselves, living to ourselves to make a name for ourselves, all apart from God, apart from Christ. Let's confess it before the Lord. In your heart, let's confess that anywhere which we've been undermining the um, each other, the work of the church and, and other areas of our lives we've been undermining Christ, we've been undermining the kingdom let's confess it and ask for a change of heart renewal eternal God we thank you for your word thank you for not leaving us without revelation thank you for all you're doing in our midst thank you that we're partakers of your kingdom today Lord, there's so much we've spoken about and touched on this morning. I pray you would help us to commit these things to memory. Help us to connect the dots as we read through scripture this year. Help us to make the links and to, to, be, to marvel at the beauty of, of scripture and all that you've done through the ages throughout redemptive history. And Lord, may us in, in, in turn, because of this joy, pursue you more and above all else. May we before a lost and a dying world live a life of kingdom. Let us have a mindset of kingdom. Let, let the choices we make be kingdom. Let them, let them ref, reflect truly that Jesus is our king. Forgive us when we live to ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for building our own kingdoms. Forgive us for setting other things before you. May you be at the may may you be the foundation, the center, the rock of our own peace within, of our marriages, of our families, of our local church congregation. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.